This is it. Our first guest is on the line. To me and to many, Tristram Stewart is basically the Pope of food waste. He put the issue in the, on the agenda over 10 years ago, back when it wasn't considered to be a problem at all. He started from the bottoms of, bottom of the bins and now we're here. Um, Tristram went from dumpster diving to founding Feedback, an organization that achieved great success in tackling food waste in the UK and dozens of other countries. He is also the founder of Toast Ale, a brewery processing surplus bread into delicious beers, and he is the author of Waste, a classic read for anyone working on food waste. Frankly, he changed society's attitude towards wasting food, and without his activism, we might not even be hosting a food waste fest right now. Maybe your organization or initiative also started because of his work. Let us know in the public chat. So to me, it's really a great honor to introduce you to Tristram Stewart, who will share his perspective on our journey of tackling food waste throughout the past years and what's in store for the future. I would like to remind you that you can ask questions to Tristram if you put them in the private chat. So Tristram, the floor is yours. Okay, that's great. Apologies for that little technical hitch. It is uh, a great entry into the first point that I wanted to make, which is um, really about my favorite word. Uh, my favorite word in the English language is companion. It means um, com is the Latin for with and pan is the Latin for bread. A companion is literally somebody you share food with. And it is a universal human behavior to use the sharing of food to build friendship, to build society, to build the networks of interdependence that humans have built their entire civilization upon. Companionship lies at the heart of everything we care about and we value. No surprise, therefore, that this word and cognates of it crop up in languages all over the world. Copain, obviously, in French, literally, with bread. Compañero, even in Greek, syntrophos, it means the same thing, with eat. And it's not just a human behavior, it's in fact a great ape behavior. All the great apes have the distribution of food at the heart of the way in which they build their social fabric. And my favorite great ape, our closest animal relative, the bonobo, um, does it better than the rest of us. Indeed, when a bonobo has surplus food, uh, it will proactively go and find other bonobos to share that surplus food with. And interestingly, if they have a choice, they will select to share their food with a stranger over and above a friend. They're essentially turning surplus food into social capital. They're making new friends. And so when, as all of us do, we talk about food waste and the colossal waste of resources and environmental impact uh, that food waste entails and is a symptom of. I also nowadays like to talk about the waste of potential companionship, loss of friendship. Think of all those friends we could make with the 1.3 billion tons of food that humans waste every year. Indeed, I would see food waste as the most egregious and obvious way in which bad companionship has entered the human, you know, human food system. There are so many broken chains within this corporate-led food system that we need to mend. I think all of them can be looked at through the lens of this word companionship. And now during lockdown, where we are physically separated from each other, and have to rely on technical rehearsals, even just to communicate words. Now more than ever, we can really appreciate just how powerful that force of companionship, the sitting down and eating food together, is to our emotional as well as our nutritional needs. When I think about what's going to happen post-COVID. Thankfully, we now are going to 
uh, see on the horizon at least the possibility of a of a, a true end to the, to the pandemic with the vaccines and not a kind of gradual fizzling out over many years. Um, if we're lucky, this will work. And we'll even be able to go back to sharing our last slice of pizza and our last chip with our with our neighbors and friends and build companionship. But either way, I'm pretty convinced that uh, once we're off the leash, the resurgence of festive companionship is going to be like pop popping open a, a, a shaken up champagne bottle. I look forward to that enormously. It's with that spirit of unbottled, festive, urgent hunger to bring people together around food that I've certainly focused my energies as a food waste campaigner over the years. Um, those bonobos have inspired me. Um, the next slide will show you uh, a bonobo feast that I uh, organized at a, at, a, at a festival in uh, Portugal a couple of years ago. And it's one of many events that I've organized, partly inspired by a meeting with um, Jane Goodall, where I was telling her about bonobos and she went and got a load of olives and started popping them in everyone's mouths at the, uh, at the very stuffy cocktail party we were both at. Uh, and um, this, this made me realize that my bonobo feast format was one that we should um, take more generally. Um, and you can see how, uh, if you go to the next slide and the one after that, uh, this the difference between we humans and um, and the bonobos, and yes, and the next slide after that, is pretty seamless. We're all cousins of each other. Um, going to my next slide, um, you will see that is that's the very beginning of what became the Feeding the 5,000 campaign. And that was uh, uh, an initiative where we fed 5,000 or more people with food that otherwise would have been wasted to general passers-by and bringing in NGOs um, from across each country where we launched this campaign. Uh, of course, Brussels was one of the places we did it. We did a bonobo feast in Antwerp. I know some of you are in Antwerp not just now. It's become an international movement. And if you just flick through the next three slides, it's um, the kind of festive companionship that we try to bring out of each of those events. That was really what lay at the heart of it. Um, I think that this way of building the movement of food waste allowed all different kinds of stakeholders to get involved. Um, we saw, of course, the NGOs and the pressure groups, but we also saw the huge surge in entrepreneurial interest in changing uh, the system, using business as the vehicle to achieve that. And I think some of the most interesting uh, moments and, and trends within this movement have been when it's been difficult to tell the difference between the entrepreneurs and the activists. Um, just recently, I spoke to Mark Zorns, co-founder of uh, Winnow's Solutions. All of you will know Mark, I'm sure, and Winnow's incredible success at helping big food businesses cut their food waste. Um, he has helped put together a, a group of businesses to campaign for the UK government's uh, imminent consultation to make food waste reporting mandatory for large food businesses. So their businesses are acting as activists. Um, Toast Ale, the company I founded, of course, is uh, an enterprise deeply connected to Feedback, the charity that I founded, not just through the money that we transfer from Toast Ale, to feedback, but in, for example, a campaign that we've recently launched, Rise Up, where we're brewing a different beer uh, every month, uh, each highlighting a different environmental issue with relation to the food system and calling on our drinkers to write to their MPs to get government to include food waste within the UK's uh, NDCs, the climate uh, uh, reduction pledges that we're supposed to be making, and generally to include food uh, policy and environment policy more generally. You just look at the way companies like Olio and Too Good To Go communicate their mission. They are activists within a business. And I think this is um, this momentum, each trend feeding the other, is one of the clear reasons why we've made progress on food waste. The United Kingdom in particular being the first country to get halfway towards our sustainable development goal of halving food waste by 2030, an incredible achievement, meaning that each individual in the UK has reduced on average 
their food waste in their home by one third since measures began, 2007, um, is the baseline there. And that, was nothing like enough, is still incredibly uh, impressive and, and, and productive way of uh, creating change. Um, that said, we are miles from uh, anything that we can call satisfactory or sustainable. If we go to the next slide, um, we can see food waste in supermarket bins, and the next slide shows um, food waste on farms. Those are all oranges that are being wasted in Peru because they're the wrong shape or size for the supermarket in the United Kingdom for whom they were grown. Now, um, where sh no, well, yes, okay, you can stay with that bread if you want. Um, that bread is the 13,000, if you go to the next slide, 13,000 slices of fresh bread that I encountered in 2008 in a sandwich factory in the UK, uh, which made me very angry. And it wasn't until I met uh, Sebastian Morvan from the Brussels Beer Project and learned that I could turn all of that stuff into beer that I, um, I realized that, you know, that was, some, that was the next thing I had to do is create a global beer business, turning bread waste into um, companionship in a bottle. And that's what Toast Ale, uh, of course, does on a daily basis. We've recycled, upcycled millions of uh, slices of bread now. Um, but if we go, I think, uh, you know, to, yes, okay, to the next slide, very briefly, Jamie Oliver drinking the first ever bottle of Toast Ale, probably lots of people have heard of that, and then skip two slides forward. Uh, I'll come to the main point that I wanted to make. Um, no, back one. Um, Elka asked me, what, what should the focus be uh, for food waste activists and entrepreneurs uh, now? And of course, it's, it's a truism to say that, of course, we shouldn't just be focusing on redistribution of surplus food. That's kind of the sticking plaster. Of course, we need to do that. That's like sending the ambulance uh, to the bottom of the cliff where people have been falling off the cliff. Uh, we have to do uh, that emergency um, kind of aid to people who need it and mopping up the mess that the food industry has been making. But it would be negligent if we didn't also go to the top of the cliff and find out why people were falling off it, put a fence at the top of the cliff, then go to the villages and find that the reason why people are running away from their homes and falling off the cliff is because some dragons have been pillaging uh, their landscape. And so then we need to go and either slay those dragons or, or even better tame them. And it is the slaying or even better taming of the dragons that I think we need to be focused on. And the dragons here, uh, let's be clear, are the big food corporations that run the food system. The food system is run on the principle of maximization of financial return for shareholders. And that has translated into uh, maximum production. And that production is being pursued at the cost of life on earth. Let's be clear, the food system is the single biggest impact that humans have on nature historically and now. This is not slowing down, it's accelerating. We continue to deforest the Amazon and Southeast Asia. We continue to erode soils at an alarming rate. It is still the biggest user of fresh water and the single biggest cause of the mass species extinction event that we are right in the middle of right now. It is a catastrophe in the making. It's not a future event. It's here, it's now, and we eat that catastrophe on a daily basis. The focus of the food waste movement needs to be on that. Yes, of course, we should focus on prevention of food waste where it arises. But if we aren't going beyond the simple focus on food waste prevention, then we've lost track of why we're here in the first place, why there is a food waste movement globally. The focus needs to be on the overproduction and the environmental consequences of that overproduction, because there is the root of food waste. There is also the root of the obesity calamity. They are two branches on the same tree. We have now got subsidies around the world, Europe and the US in particular, that are using public money to fund that overproduction and that unsustainable exploitation of the land to produce unhealthy food at a profit for big corporations. We allow corporations to advertise their junk to us on a colossal scale, resulting in, in the UK alone, the food that the supermarkets sell that we end up throwing away 
is worth billions of pounds to those companies. Tesco alone makes four billion pounds a year on food that its customers throw away. That's what we have to remember when we're tackling food waste. It is in the interest of these corporations to be involved in the massive overproduction and overselling of food. So it may be that the UK policy on mandatory food waste reporting is a very significant step in tackling food waste, but it is also emphatically the case that the consultation that is happening right now in the UK to ban all online, all online advertising of junk food, that has as much to do with food waste as it has to do with anything else. And if we've lost sight of that, like I say, we've lost the, the original direction. That doesn't mean that each and every one of us has to be active on advertising and consumption and junk food, but it means we do want to see how connected we are to those organizations and those individuals who are doing that work. We are part of a mycelial network, a global mycelial network that is in the process of emerging. And when we recognize that we in this movement, policymakers, NGOs, campaigners, activists, entrepreneurs, inventors, we are part of a global companionship. And between us, as we emerge, we need to recognize the connections between us, get out of our logos and brands and individual ego-driven, brand-driven silos <clears throat> and connect with each other in good companionship and foster the good companionship. You don't need to go forward into any slides anymore. I'm kind of winding up. <clears throat> we need to tackle those big corporate beasts, Monsanto and Cargill, who are intent on putting the Amazon rainforest through a machine that eats nature and shits cash. That's what the food waste movement is about, as far as I'm concerned. And building that good companionship between fellow humans and between humans and the natural world. Thanks very much. OK. I'm back? OK, cool. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tristram. I hope that you can see me now. So we are technically OK, OK, cool. Um, all right. I see double everywhere, Tristram. OK. Um, I have a question from you from, from the audience. Um, well, and it's also in the theme of the Food Waste Fest, actually. How do you think that we can start the right collaborations to get um, food waste action going? Um, well, what are the barriers? Well, I think I mentioned just very briefly uh, to uh, the ego and the brand. I see the reason why the food waste movement and indeed the environmental and social justice movement more generally as uh, having perhaps not managed to emerge into the full power that I think it is capable of is that people work in these little artificial cells uh, promoting themselves and their own brands. I am fully guilty. Well, no, I'm not even going to say guilty. I've definitely acted in that spirit myself for many years. And I don't repudiate it. You get lots of great stuff done. But the more we can think of ourselves as mycelial strands in this connection with the occasional big, beautiful, or poisonous for that matter, but let's hope beautiful mushroom up there in the surface pumping out its spores around the world, most of us are underground connecting with each other, passing nourishment, wisdom, and resources to those who need it in the most effective way. And so I think, uh, yes, always looking at that big picture. Um, and, you know, uh, the motto that we have at Toast Ale is if you want to change the world, you've got to throw a better party than the people destroying it. And I think together we've, uh, we've got a good track record of throwing some excellent parties uh, in the name of tackling food waste and saving the planet. And, um, and we should, uh, post COVID, really focus on where is the next big party and, and how do we get 7 billion people, nearly 8 billion people to come and join it. Um, that, you know, make it as, as fun, as exciting, as delicious, as nutritious as we possibly can, and people will flock. All right. Well, I actually hope that we can one day have this party in real life. Um, I would look forward to it. Um, I have another question for you coming from Christopher Bishop. Um, he's wondering if you see that after COVID, we will be more or less concerned with food waste, knowing what, what we've been through just now. Or do you think that we will be concerned with another fad or fashion? Are we all a little biased? He's wondering. 
Um, well, I, you, you bring out the deep, dark pessimist that lurks within me, uh, Chris. I, um, if you're asking what I think is likely to happen, unfortunately, I think what's likely to happen is that we continue in the trajectory that we've been pursuing for the last few decades, and that is accelerating towards an ecological calamity uh, of geological uh, significance. Uh, the Anthropocene is uh, going to involve it would seem the annihilation of most of the species that exist on this planet, probably the suffering of some billions of people and the irreparable harm to the biosphere. I think that's probably what will happen. However, I hope that it isn't what will happen. And I believe that it is still possible for us to avert the worst of that scenario. And it is in that hope that we must dwell. We are on the brink of a precipice. I find myself on the brink of despair when I look over that precipice. But I know that behind me there are acres of wonderful flower-filled, fruit-filled fields with people ready to dance. And we know already technologically how to produce food and farm in a way that creates habitat rather than destroys it replenishes water tables rather than depletes them. Most importantly, we know how to farm in a way that sucks carbon out of the atmosphere and embeds it in soils. Indeed, I believe that carbon sequestration on agricultural land is the single biggest opportunity to mitigate climate change out of everything, a massively underestimated resource. And if we direct our farm subsidies that I mentioned earlier towards achieving that, as well as habitat creation and nature preservation, and water management instead of towards overproduction of unhealthy foods, then I think we really have the possibility of using the food system to combat those big health and environmental health issues. I think we can do it. I think that COVID presents an incredible opportunity for us to work together globally to achieve that. We already know that people are cooking more at home, they're wasting less, they're much more conscious of what they buy. We also know people are thinking about their connection to nature in a much more visceral, live, and meaningful way than they have done in their lives, if, you know, if not for a century. It's incredible how this has resurg uh, resurged, this emotion. And I think most importantly, what COVID has done, and it may surprise some to hear that I've been speculating and writing on the consequences of global pandemic for about 20 years now. And one of the scenarios that I have written about is that what a virus does to humanity is what an alien invasion would do. This is a non-human entity. It is through the non-human other that we recognize our unity, that we are one human species living on one planet. And it is in that recognition, in that identity of us as a global species, that countries are a fabrication, that corporations are in our imagination, but that the world and the life that lives on it is a biological fact. And there we need to build our solutions through global companionship and everything that flows from that. I believe that COVID could play a really significant part in helping us to emerge as that global superorganism that I've been talking about. Okay. Thank you very much, Tristram. Um, we were hoping for a really inspirational start and you've definitely given it to us. So thank you very much. And I look forward to hosting you next year uh, for real at the Food Waste Fest. <laughs>